Number theory, as the name suggests, is well, the study of numbers and patterns within them. But specifically, it tends to relate to the study of the integers and what patterns there are between these and certain properties of these relationships. And it's, it holds a curious place in mathematics in the sense that it's simultaneously one of the oldest fields of study, going back several millennia, but it's also one of the most modern fields of study where we will see later in this subject uses in cryptography, in security systems, which all rely on patterns between the integers. Think back now to the video where we discussed equivalence relations. We can say that two integers a and b are equivalent if they have the same remainder when divided by another non-zero integer d, or equivalently if d divides the difference b minus a. We can easily show that this is an equivalence relation because an equivalence relation had to satisfy three properties. Well, this is clearly reflexive because A has the same remainder as A when divided by D, or I could say A minus A is divisible by D because zero is divisible by any integer. It's also symmetric because if A has the same remainder as B, B has the same remainder as A. And lastly, it needed to be transitive, which it is, because if A has the same remainder as B, B has the same remainder as C, then A has the same remainder as C. So it's reflexive, symmetric and transitive, so it's an equivalence. So let's just work with this definition. Well, if we know that A is equivalent to B, mod D, then I know that there exists some other integer K, such that B can be written as K multiples of D plus A. Just in terms of a little bit of Notation here, rather than writing this divisibility and the remainder, if we write B in these square brackets with a little subscript D, we will mean the remainder of B when divided by D. So a couple of simple examples here. Um, I think the easiest one is the odd or even one. So B the remainder of B when divided by 2, it's 0 if B is even, and 1 if B is odd. I'm assuming B is an integer here. Or the remainder when divided by 10 of any number written in base 10. So the remainder of 7 when divided by 10 is 7. The remainder of 97 when divided by 10 is 7. The remainder of 327 when divided by 10 is 7. So for positive integers, the remainder when divided by 10 is just the last digit. So here, 7, 97, 327 all have last digit 7. There is the slight catch, of course, with negative numbers that minus 3 is also equivalent to 7, even though the last digit is not 7, because when I get to negatives, I sort of go the other way. Because if I think of evenly spacing, going down, 37, 27, 17, 7, go down another 10, and I'll hit minus 3. So you need to be a little bit careful with negatives, but other than that, for positives, you can just take the last digit for the remainder when divided by 10. So what this does is it gives us a remainder which has to be between 0 and D. It can be 0 if there's no remainder at all, 
but it can't be d. It has to be, I suppose, less than or equal to d minus 1. That the last digit, for example, of a number written in base 10, it can be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, but it won't be 10. That's not a single digit. A simple example of number theory is the fact that the remainder of A when divided by D multiplied by the remainder of B when divided by D. If I calculate that, multiply those two things together and take that remainder um, when divided by D, that's the same as the remainder of A times B when divided by D. So an example of this, which you probably already know, is I can just think of multiplying two integers and considering the parity, so whether they are odd or even. If I've got A even, um, then AB will be even. And if B is even, then AB is even. The only way I can multiply two integers, A and B, and produce an odd number is if they're both odd. And that's because if I think of the remainder when divided by 2, an odd number leaves a remainder of 1 when divided by 2, and an even number leaves a remainder of 0 when divided by 2. And if I think of that in terms of simple multiplication, well, 0 times 0, or 1 times 0, or 0 times 1, all equal 0. So even times even will give me the same, or an equivalent answer to an odd times even, will give me an equivalent answer to an even times odd, which will be an even number. Whereas 1 times 1 is 1, because an odd number multiplied by an odd number will give me an odd number. So we've shown that that's true for this simple example. But we haven't proven it in general. So now let's prove this in general, not just for the division by two, the odd or even case, but division by any positive integer d. If I say the remainder of a when divided by d is r, and the remainder of b when divided by d is s, then I know that I must have a being k multiples of d plus a remainder r for some integer k, and b is j multiples of d plus a remainder s for some integer j. So the left-hand side I can just substitute those in and say the remainder R and the remainder S multiplied together gives me RS. So the left hand side gives me the remainder of RS when divided by D. Now the right hand side, if I replace A with KD plus R and replace B with JD plus S, then when I multiply those out, expand the brackets, I'll get kjd squared plus um, uh, rjd plus kds plus rs and its remainder when divided by d. When I look at that, the first term has a d in it, in fact it has d squared, the second term's divisible by d, the third term's divisible by d, so all three of those uh, first three terms are divisible by d. So the remainder of that part when divided by d is zero. So all I'm left with is the remainder of the rs when divided by d. So what I've got there is that I can show the right hand side is just the remainder of r times s when divided by d, which is the same as the left hand side. So a relatively simple proof. An obvious question to ask at this point is why 
is this study of remainders in any way useful? Why would we care about this um, result? Well, one way we can use it is to check for errors in large multiplications without having to do the difficult large multiplication. So let's say that somebody tells us that they've calculated 238 multiplied by 538 is uh, 128,144. Now that is not true, but how can we establish that that's not true or rather use the properties of remainders? Well, a couple of simple sense checks are, well, they're claiming an even number multiplied by an even number is even. Yep, that checks out. Also, if I look at the last digit, something ending in eight multiplied by something ending in eight should be equivalent to eight times eight should be equivalent to 64, i.e. should end in four, which this does. So the two simplest sense checks, this is still plausible for. If I look at divisibility by three and the remainder when divided by three, 238 leaves a remainder of one when divided by three, because it's 79 lots of three, plus one left over. Also, 538 leaves a remainder of one when divided by three, because 538 is 179 lots of three, plus one. So if it were true, then when I multiplied those numbers, they would leave a remainder of one times one is one. But when I work out the remainder of one to eight, one, four, four, when divided by three, I get a remainder of two. So through this property of remainders, I have managed to show that that alleged multiplication in the second dot point is wrong. This study of the products of remainders and their remainders gives us a nice trick that admittedly only works in a couple of cases, mod 10. And that I can check divisibility by either three or nine really quickly. When we write a number in base 10 format, for example, 23051, that two is not a two. It's 20,000, two lots of 10 to the four. The three is not a three, it's 3,000, three lots of 10 to the three, and so on. We also can exploit this fact that 10 is equivalent to one mod three. And the same argument works if I did division by nine instead of three. So what this does mean is that if I say, well, two times 10 to the four, its remainder when divided by three is gonna be the same as the remainder of two when divided by three and the remainder multiplied by the remainder of 10 to the four when divided by three, take its remainder divided by three. But of course, by the fact that 10 is equivalent to one when divided by three, 10 to the four is equivalent to one when divided by three. So I know that the remainder of two times 10 to the four when divided by three is just the same as the remainder of two when divided by three. Similarly, pick the next digit and I can say that the remainder of three times 10 to the three when divided by three is the same as the remainder of three when divided by three. So if I just work this logic all the way through, each digit's remainder when divided by three, if I add all of those up, I will get the remainder of the whole thing when divided by three. So here, instead of trying to work out the remainder of 23051 when divided by three, I'll just add up two plus three plus zero plus five plus one is 11. The remainder of 11 when divided by three is two because three lots of three is nine plus a remainder of two to get to 11. And I could repeat that same argument with division by nine as well as three.